Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Got a few people hung up in the waiting room, but we're almost here. There we go. All right, thank you so much for joining us today. We are happy to have you with us. And I'm just gonna start right out of the gate before I even get to like our normal list of things by telling you all that we are not gonna do this Q&A next week. It is Thanksgiving week for those who celebrate and we thought it would be nice to just give everybody a little bit of extra time not dealing with work related stuff so we will not be here next week so please plan to join us the following week when we will back be back on our normal schedule. I'm going to start with our Zoom housekeeping items, which is what we do each week, and let you know that your Zoom toolbar or taskbar is probably at the bottom of your screen. That's where you're going to find your mute and unmute button, as well as your start or stop video button. So if you need privacy, of course, turn your video off. If you want us to be able to see you today, then turn your video on. We do ask that everybody stay muted for the duration of the Zoom, unless you need to unmute yourself to ask a question. That just cuts down on background noise. The chat, um, in fact, that bubble might be flashing at you right now, depending on what kind of device you're using. The chat function is the best way to submit questions or requests for clarification during the Zoom today. I just put a message in there telling you how to look for our YouTube channel and the email address where you can send us questions that we don't get to this week. So you can pay attention to that information and also use the chat to submit any questions that you have for us today. We do wanna remind everybody that we are here to discuss general legal information, not to give legal advice. So if somebody sends you one of our videos or one of our blog posts or anything else and says that you have to do something or can't do something because CLG said so, you can just ignore that. And I, you know, as a reminder, you can only get legal advice from your association attorney who is familiar with all of your documents and your specific situation. And that's not us in the context of this Zoom. Please also keep in mind that the chat function is intended for use to ask questions or requests for clarification. And we sometimes put you know, links in there or uh, statute references. It's not intended to be a sort of messaging service kind of like the CAI message boards. So we ask that everybody just refrain from posting legal commentary in the chat. And keep in mind, you can't rely on anything you see in the chat as legal advice either. Uh, as we've been reminding everybody since forever, it seems like the nonprofit corporate filings are still not available online. Thank you, Michelle Weaver. Michelle Weaver uh, commented on one of our YouTube videos and said that she talked to the Secretary of State last week, and it sounds like they hope to be up and running by the end of this year. So I'm not going to hold my breath because they've been saying that since February, but Hopefully that's a more realistic timeline and we'll keep you posted, you know, of course, as we as soon as we see that change. We also want to remind everybody that we think it's appropriate for boards to consider and review their COVID protocols, if you have any, at your monthly board meeting and to even consider adding a consideration of those protocols to your standing board meeting agenda. This is helpful because as a practical matter, it allows you to sort of keep the COVID stuff, which is ever changing, it seems like, at the forefront of your mind. It also, I think, provides some decent evidence that the association is being proactive and taking COVID seriously, which could be helpful if there's ever a question of that further down the road. Again, no Q&A on November 23rd. Next week, we will not be here. And with that, I think we're ready to jump into the questions unless Ken, you had something you wanted to chat about before that. I'm good. Okay. Here's our first question. For budget ratification, can the homeowners ask for paper ballots or vote on the portal? If most of the association members cannot attend the budget ratification meeting due to the time of day, would we be allowed to have people vote electronically on our website? Can we give members the option of either attending or of voting online? I think the simplest way that I can put this is that voting has to happen in at, it has to conclude at least at the budget ratification meeting, which has to occur in real time. So <clears throat> can you attend the meeting and vote in person? Yes. Could you attend it via Zoom if it is an electronic meeting and vote that way? Yes. Could you vote with a proxy or a ballot? I think, yes, you can. So the voting section of all of our governing statutes 
those those sections were amended last year and they all say that voting can occur by a voice vote a show of hands standing at a meeting a written ballot an absentee ballot prepared by the association or by any other method for determining the votes of unit owners as designated by the person presiding at the meeting so I want to remind you all that since we're talking about budget ratification, this is the specific topic of the question. At the budget ratification meeting, you only vote if somebody makes a motion to reject the budget. Otherwise, it's automatically ratified. If someone does move to reject the budget, then you can have the owners vote in a variety of ways, including all the ones I just mentioned. And as long as the person who's running the meeting determines that the method of voting is effective and allows that person to determine how everybody has voted, then your method um, is, is up to you. We can offer, can't, I want to make sure I'm enunciating clearly here, can't offer an, an informed opinion or a recommendation to use any particular electronic method of voting. We know that there's voting softwares out there, but we don't know enough about each of them specifically to know whether they meet the standards and allow the person presiding over the meeting to determine how everybody has voted. So again, the voting has to either take place at or conclude during the meeting. The statute says unless at that meeting, the unit owners of units to which a majority of the votes vote to reject the budget, it's ratified, whether or not there's a quorum present. You don't have to achieve a quorum. So again, I think the voting does have to happen either uh, at the meeting or by proxy or a ballot prepared by the association, another approved method of voting, even if you're not present at the meeting. And I think you need to conclude the voting by the end of the meeting. I do wanna say though, that no court has yet interpreted this statute to de definitively confirm that our opinion is the correct one. But we always assume that our clients wanna approach things like this from the perspective of minimizing risk. And so we think this is the lowest risk way to proceed. And then just because we say this all the time, but I think we probably can't say it often enough. There are certainly things in your governing documents that could sort of tweak or change a little bit the way that we approach mm -hmm advising a client that's asking us this question. So again, this isn't legal advice. And if you need legal advice to determine what is allowed for your association in terms of voting at your budget ratification meeting, then you should consult with your association attorney. And did you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I, I get worried by electronic voting. Um, there's nothing in any of the statutes which actually mentions or authorizes electronic voting there is uh, a strong push by some managers and certainly by vendors selling electronic voting to convince you that that is the best way to go. And I don't have any good evidence that that's the best way to go. I am concerned that when we get an owner who's trying to challenge procedure, they will bring that up and be successful. And so if you're doing something where the vote is important, like you're ratifying a special assessment or you're electing uh, board members in a contested election, I would want to make sure that uh, you did a process that uh, certainly was not exclusively electronic voting. If you don't allow people to vote by the other means that are offered in the statute and you try and require them to vote by the electronic portal, which I know some of our clients have done, I think you're taking an enormous risk. And uh, we've already had one lawsuit uh, against one of our clients because of a vote taken at a Zoom meeting where an owner was not able to log into the Zoom. So they sued to try and uh, uh, invalidate the results of the election. And that lawsuit's been going on for six months now. Okay. Uh, so, Electronic voting through these websites are not a quick, easy solution which we can verify actually comply with the requirements of the statute. So the results that you get, if they're close or that are contested, we're probably going to advise you, you need to do another vote by a means which complies exactly with the statute to ratify the decision that you already made.
Yeah, and I think it's worth pointing out that even if the association ultimately prevails in that lawsuit that's been filed against them, they still have to deal with the litigation that's been going on, like Ken said, for six months. So you want your procedure to, uh, to be correct. I also think it's worth mentioning that when talking about how an association can conduct meetings, and offering the option of, or the, you know, the ability for any association to hold meetings virtually, it's really clear that there has to be an opportunity for someone who doesn't have a computer and doesn't have the ability to attend by Zoom to participate in that meeting in some other way. And I think that is analogous to what we're talking about here with limiting owners to only voting electronically. I think you can get yourself in pretty big trouble by doing that. All right, next question. Uh, can I, as a homeowner, record our monthly Zoom meetings and post them on our Facebook community page for other homeowners to watch at their convenience? Because our meetings are held at 5.15 p.m. and most homeowners are still working, driving home, doing dinner, et cetera. You know, Ken, I just realized that when we were talking about this question, I missed entirely that the person was asking about a Zoom meeting. And uh, the answer is a little bit different than if we were talking about an in-person board meeting. So there's no statute that prohibits an owner from recording a board, a board meeting. And I, what I will offer is if we were talking about an in-person board meeting and an owner was just holding their phone and recording, there's nothing, there's no law that, that requires them to stop or that prohibits them from doing that. That doesn't mean that the owner has the right to post that video, for example, on the association's website or the association maintained Facebook page. So your options would be as an owner, I guess, to post it on your own page or maybe email it to people or, you know, maybe there's a community page for your, you know, for your group and you could post it in there. Um, I think it's important to note that regardless, the record of what actions were taken at the board meeting is not that video the minutes are the definitive record of what happened at that meeting. So I think that's just something to keep in mind. I will offer that as a logistical matter, if you are a participant in a Zoom, you don't necessarily have the right to record because that is something that requires the person who is conducting the Zoom, the meeting host, to give people permission to do. So I don't even know the answer to this question, but Katie, I'm just going to pick on you since I know that you uh, are not running this Zoom, um, and I'm not putting one of our other participants on the spot. Katie's one of our attorneys, by the way, for anybody who doesn't know. Katie, do you have the option to record this Zoom right now? Yes. What happens if you click the button? Please ask the host to give you permission to record. Right. So I think that the board doesn't have to say yes if you ask permission to record a Zoom meeting, but Ken might have a different opinion on this. What do you think, Ken? Well, I, I do get a little bit worried about the fact that you end up with lots of content out there in the same way that these Q and A's are producing a lot of content. And then you have people pulling excerpts from it, trying to prove a point which may not be supported by the uh, actual full video or by a series of other decisions that might be made. So especially if you start talking at board meetings about an upcoming major repair project. And the project is gonna change its scope and timing as you get more information. And so early meetings may not be indicative of what actually happens later when the board is making decisions with more information. Uh, on the other hand, I don't really have objections to, the, to open meetings so that people who care can participate and understand what's going on in real time. So, uh, Part of me gets a little bit suspicious. I know there are the conspiracy theorists out there. I want to not be one and assume that the person doing the recording is doing it for some evil purpose. But I don't know that that's actually the case. Right. So I think what that fault, well, you know, the, the short answer is if it's an in person meeting, you're probably allowed to do that. And if it's a Zoom meeting, you can ask, but I don't think your board has to say yes. Um, there's a follow-up question in the chat about the budget ratification voting process. People in my meeting last night asked about proxies for ratification meetings. Is that an option? Uh, the short answer, I think, is that yes, it's an option. Proxies are an option. Ballots, absentee ballots that are prepared by the association are an option. 
On the other hand, there's a part of me that's like, why, 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 why do you make it so easy for your owners to reject the budget? I don't know. I just, I don't want to make it easy for owners to reject the budget. If owners feel really strongly about rejecting the budget, they can either attend the meeting, they can write out a ballot, sorry, a proxy and give it to their neighbor, um, or they can request a ballot from the association. So, you know, that's sort of my knee jerk reaction to that, but I'm open to differing opinions if anybody has one. And I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Ken. Well, I am researching right now. The statute for voting says, except as provided otherwise in the declaration or organizational documents, the following applies to proxy voting. So theoretically, your bylaws or your declaration could prohibit proxies. I have very rarely seen that. And I think it's contrary to making it easier for the majority of the owners to vote and therefore do what the community desires. But it would be, I think, possible to amend your bylaws or your declaration to require that the votes be actually by the owners in person at a meeting. If you wanted to make it really difficult in order to reject a budget, but you could also increase that percentage required to reject a budget to something higher than uh, a majority. The statute allows you to pick 75% or 80% so that the decision of the board is going to be automatically uh, you know, ratified if you don't get that super majority as required by your documents. So you do have to pay attention to the documents. And so that's why we can't give you a definitive answer for your community in this, uh, this forum. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Ken. I wanted to offer also that there are a couple of comments in the chat, which I think are well taken, which is that just because your board doesn't give you permission to record the Zoom meeting, in using the Zoom record function, doesn't mean that there aren't other ways, you know, screen captures and other different ways that you could record the content of the Zoom meeting. So we, we realize that that's the case. We can't answer this question from every possible sort of scenario or approach that an owner might take to try to record it. So I think really the bottom line goes back to, there's no statute that prevents it. I uh, don't think the board has to let you record it using the Zoom function. Um, but yes, we know that there are other ways that you could sort of find to work around that. Uh, the voting statute that you were referring to, Ken, about the proxies, what statute is that? Do you? The one I was reading is 6438.120. Subsection That's... five is about the proxies. Thank and you. Again, every one of the statutes was rewritten with identical language for voting. So it's subsection five in. 64, 32, 280, uh, 38, 120. I can't remember the numbers for you, if Kyle, you just, or the other. If you just Google your governing statute, so if you're a new act condo, RCW 64.34, and then voting, you just Google that, it will pull you, it'll take you straight to the sub, the section of the new act that deals with voting. And for all of them, I think the numbering is the same. And so the subsection five should be where you're looking to talk about that proxy stuff. Yeah, but you start with subsection one that says owners may vote at a meeting in person by absentee uh, absentee ballot or by proxy. Yes. And then the proxy refers to subsection five. Thank you, Ken. All right, here's the next question. Does the new Condominium Act or Wakaiowa allow a condo association or its management company to charge a fee to owners for providing access to association records, such as bank records, invoices, et cetera? If so, is there a limit on such fees? RCW 6434-372 says that such records must be made reasonably available. Does reasonably available mean that a fee can be charged? So I'm gonna answer backwards. I don't think that reasonably available means that a fee can be charged. I think reasonably available is, is referring to the amount of time it takes you to allow an owner to review records, et cetera. But I think based on all of the statutory provisions that speak to this question, we believe that an association can charge owners reasonable costs associated with their request to review records 
including the cost of copying. The new act itself is silent on whether the association can charge the owner for providing access to records. Wakiowa, and this, the provision of Wakiowa is 6490-495, subsection 4, says that an association may charge a reasonable fee for producing and providing copies of any records under this section and for supervising the unit owner's inspection. The HOA Act also has a similar provision, 64-38-045, subsection 2, says the association can impose and collect a reasonable charge for copies and any reasonable costs incurred by the association in providing access to the records. For new act condos, I think the most important provision is out of the nonprofit corporation statute. So RCW 24.03a.220 allows a nonprofit corporation to impose a reasonable charge covering the costs of labor and material for copies of any other documents provided to the member. The charge may not exceed the estimated cost of production, reproduction, or transmission of the records. So we talk a lot about the word reasonable. I think I've said it like 27 times just in giving you this answer, right? Reading all the different statutory provisions. Reasonableness is the standard by which the courts evaluate association actions. And this is true with respect to the fees that you charge your members as well. So if you are responding to a records request, your, your charge to the owner must be reasonable. And the way a court will evaluate whether it's reasonable, at least in part, is whether it's related to the actual cost incurred by the association in providing access to the records. So if an owner asks you for the minutes for the last year and you spend three minutes sending them an email back and attaching the PDFs of the minutes for the last year and you charge them $150, I think that would probably as a fee be found to be unreasonable. On the other hand, if the owner requests the right to review all of the bank statements for the last five years and they have to come into the management company, the management company has to arrange for boxes to be put into a conference room and for an employee to sort of facilitate the owner's review of those records and then also to make copies. I think it would be reasonable to charge the owner for those copies and also perhaps up to a point for the time or charge from the management company to the association. So the answer to this question really largely depends on the circumstances, including the volume of the records requested, whether the owner wants copies of them all, etc. And I would say that if you're wondering about whether the charge you're contemplating is reasonable, you should consult with your association attorney who can give you an opinion on that. Ken, did you want to add anything to that? Well, just to, to follow up, if the reason you want to charge a fee is just to discourage owners from asking for documents, then you probably don't have a legal right to charge the fee. I think that's a great way to put it. All right, next question. Wakiowa at 6490-545 states that one of the conditions for an association not being required to have a reserve study is if the cost of the study is more than 10% of the annual budget. Is that 10% of operations or operations and reserves combined? It's 10% of the entire budget, which includes the budgeted contributions to the reserve account. I think it's worth pointing out that there is no penalty for having a reserve study. The remedy for an association that hasn't had a reserve study is that if it's been more than three years since the last reserve study prepared by a reserve study professional, the owners holding a certain percentage of the voting power can vote to require the board to include the cost of a reserve study in the next annual budget, and then they have to do the reserve study with that money. Under the HOA Act, the percentage of voting power required for the owners to sort of force this issue is 35%. Under the Condominium Act and Wakiowa, the percentage is 20%. So it's going to come out and be like, you have to, you know, we're finding you a million dollars because of study. The remedy for the owners is to get enough votes together to force the board to include it in the budget and then do the reserve study that year. Um, we seem to get a lot of questions. I, I feel like a lot more lately that make it clear that associations don't want to have reserve studies done. 
And I think that it's worth just commentary, offering the commentary that the legislature at least has decided that the risk of not having a reserve study <clears throat> is high enough that most associations are required to do so. In other words, most don't qualify for the exemptions that are listed in the statutes. And if you don't have a reserve study, you're required to disclose that on your resale certificate. The legislature also requires reserve related disclosures to be made during the budget ratification process, which tells us that they think it's important not just to advise prospective owners, but current owners about the state of the association's reserves. And unless your association is extraordinarily small or has little to no common areas or expenses, we agree generally that having a reserve study is important. And the way the statute's written, you're required to have a site visit, an on-site reserve study every three years. And in the two intervening years, you have to have an update that does not require a site visit. If you're looking to sort of, I cut corners isn't the right word, just conserve financial resources, save money, you could pay a reserve study professional to come out to do the site visit reserve study every three years. And then the board can update the numbers of the reserve study in those two intervening years. So I also think it's worth mentioning that we have clients, like a lot of clients over the last, I don't know, 15 years that I've been doing this and Ken longer than me, 20 some, that have had to impose very, very, very large special assessments. And some of them have been due in part to a combination of deferred maintenance and failure to contribute to the reserves. I think I've mentioned a client before in these Zooms that bragged and bragged and bragged for like 10 or 12 years that they'd never raised the dues and that in part included not contributing sufficiently to their reserve fund. And they ended up with uh, special assessments in excess of you know $50,000 per unit. I mean, it varied. Um, because of a combination of deferred maintenance and not having an adequately funded reserve study. So I think it's an important thing to answer the question. It's 10% of your whole budget, including your reserve study contributions, because that's part of your budget. Um, and there is no penalty, but the owners can sort of force the issue if it's been more than three years since a reserve study professional has done a study for you. Ken, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think you've covered it. Okay. Next question. I have a board that was told by a previous management company that for any special assessment, there needs to be a resolution prior to the ratification process. Is this something that is supposed to happen or even suggested? So I think this is probably a matter of terminology differences. The ratification process for a special assessment is essentially the same as for the regular budget. The board has to vote to approve the special assessment. Then they send out the notice to the owners, hold the ratification meeting, et cetera. There's no specific resolution that's required. It's just a board vote at a meeting to adopt the special assessment. But sometimes some people refer to every board vote as a resolution. So do you have to have like a specifically written out resolution in order to adopt a special assessment? No. Does the board have to vote to adopt the special assessment? before then sending out that budget and getting the owners to ratify it, yes. So Ken talked during last week's Q&A about what exactly a resolution is. So you can watch last week's video for more information if you want to kind of understand the nuances of some of that. But I think this is probably a matter of terminology differences. Ken, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, just if the, the special assessment is not going to go to the owners unless the board has adopted it and they're going to adopt it by a vote they could do it at a meeting they could do it by unanimous written consent and ratify it at the next meeting but uh, you know i don't i don't think there's a risk that somehow a special assessment ratification meeting is going to occur if the board has not authorized it right okay here's our next question are there any RCWs that speak to the right of a homeowner within an HOA to rent their property? I haven't been able to find any reference there myself. The short answer is no. For single family HOAs formed under the HOA Act, there is no statute that governs an owner's right to rent their home. And in fact, that's true also for HOAs formed under WCAIWA. There's nothing in WCAIWA or the HOA Act that specifically says you have the right to rent your home or you can only rent your home if the CCNRs allow it or whatever. The 
The ability to rent your home is a property right that comes with your ownership of the property. It's not limited by statute. However, the recorded CCNRs could restrict that right under certain circumstances. So there's no statute that says you can or can't. This is sort of a common law property right that goes along with you know, your rights when you purchase the property. And it could be limited by your recorded CCNRs under certain circumstances. Did you wanna add anything to that, Ken? Yeah, the court cases which have addressed this have always looked at the governing documents. So Wilkers, Wilkerson v. Chihuahua was interpreting the recitals of the governing documents and deciding whether or not the HOA had the ability to restrict rentals. And most of the recitals for HOAs or single family home communities will start with something like saying that the, uh, the intention is that these are single family homes on an ownership or rental basis. And that's the entire reference in the document to whether you can rent or not. They may put restrictions on the types of leases or the timelines on you know, shortest period of time you can rent or longest period of time. But you know, and, until the last 10 years, none of this was considered an issue in most single family home communities. People rent it all the time. Thanks, Ken. All right, next question. Is it required to send paper notices for fines or processing fees? If an owner has not opted in to receive notices electronically, then those notices must be sent by mail. Once an owner has opted in, then most notices may be sent electronically. There are some exceptions like the pre-foreclosure notice of delinquency that we'll talk about a little bit more later. We do recommend that with higher risk notices or higher dollar amounts at issue, sending things by mail in addition to email is a good idea, even when an owner has opted in to receiving electronic notices. Some examples might include notices that have to be sent before an association can proceed with litigation against an owner, uh, notices about daily fines that are gonna add up really quickly in terms of the dollar amount, um, notices of a really large special assessment that you want your owners to ratify. So again, even if your owners have opted in to receiving notice electronically, there are times when we would probably say, hey, you know what, it's a good idea to pop that notice in the mail as well. I will also offer a caveat, which is that you need to review the governing documents for each association, especially when it comes to the fine slash enforcement slash hearing process to determine exactly what notices have to be sent in order to assess enforceable fines. Some of the documents are incredibly specific and nitpicky about the process. And so that's just something to be aware of when you're thinking about these notices. Ken, did you wanna add anything else to that? Uh, yes, uh, again, related to, you must read the specific governing documents. If they require that notice be sent by certified or registered mail, which many of them do, an electronic notice is not going to work even if they have agreed to receive notice electronically because it is not certified or registered mail. And uh, I think that uh, you also have to look at some of the procedures because there was an attorney who was writing procedures that required a sworn affidavit by the board secretary that they had sent the notice by certified or registered mail, in addition to the actual certified mail. And I would say it's it would, a ridiculous requirement to have put into the documents, but we have found it in a number of different communities documents because this attorney had, for whatever reason, decided that that was important. Thanks, Ken. All right, next question. Have you had any experience with dog DNA testing? Not sure how this would work in reality. I understand the issue is trying to get residents to clean up after their pets, but is this considered a true solution? Just when you thought you were, you knew all the topics that we ever covered in the Q&A, we come up with a new one. So we do know of associations that require owners to register their dog's DNA with the association. So the association can verify which dog is the culprit when an owner fails to clean up after them in the common areas. 
Uh, we also understand some communities require DNA testing for the purpose of breed identification because some communities have breed restrictions. I will offer that the cost of animal DNA testing is not small. And for many communities, if we're talking about this as an enforcement measure for people who don't pick up after their dogs, uh, this might not be a very cost-effective way of approaching it. And there are other ways to monitor who might be leaving their dog's mess behind, including potentially security cameras in the common areas where the problem is occurring. Um, an association can also be proactive and try to make it easier for their owners to clean up after their pets by installing like disposal stations with dogs and trash cans and whatnot sorry, bags and trash cans. And depending on what your governing documents allow, if an association can document dog related expenses, it might be possible to charge a reasonable pet fee to cover those costs, but that's not something I would want to uh, suggest without an association specifically consulting with its association attorney to determine whether that is a reasonable thing to do under your documents. So yes, we've heard of it. I can't imagine that it's a very cost-effective way for the most part of dealing with enforcement issues. And we think that there are other ways. Uh, Ken, did you want to add anything on that one? Well, personally, I think it would be silly to try and require every dog in a community to have DNA testing and register it with the association. And then to start sending in samples of dog crap to get DNA sample tests so that I could find a perpetrator it. <laughs> now, there, there's a reasonableness factor to your rules. I don't know that that's going to pass the reasonableness test. I will also offer the only communities that I have heard of that have done this are, you know, very high income, high cost, uh, you know, million dollar condos in downtown, million plus, I should say, in downtown Seattle. So, uh, you know, this is not something that I think as a practical matter that is cost effective for the vast majority of communities. I also would be like, well, who has to pay for the DNA testing? Does the owner have to pay or does the association have to pay? I, it just seems like a lot of work for a uh, very little payback or return on investment, I guess. Um, but that's just me. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to our next question now. How involved should owners be in pointing out issues to a reserve study company? And or should we truly be relying on them to provide us with insight that we would not have? We are concerned that we might be getting fleeced. We wanna trust the reserve calendar and the company who creates it. How do we vet that our company is doing a good job or do we simply move on to another? And lastly, are there reputable companies that you recommend? So as a starting point, you want to make sure that the reserve study company you're working, excuse me, working with is reputable and, and has experience working with communities like yours. So I think part of how you get to a point where you can trust your reserve study company is by picking a good one, right? So a good place to look for reserve study companies is the member directory on the WSCAI website. So Chelsea, could you put WSCAI.org into the chat? I don't know if everybody here is familiar with the Washington State Community Associations Institute, but it is a, it's a national, actually international trade group. We have a Washington State chapter and it exists to advocate for and provide educational opportunities for community associations, board members, managers, all the different vendors that serve HOAs and condo associations. If your reserve study company is a member of WSCAI, I think my hope at least is that as a starting point, they value the advocacy and the education provided by WSCAI. So that's not a definitive like, yes, they're an amazing company, but it's at least a starting point. I think you can also ask your reserve study company for references if they're willing to give you references for other boards with, with which they have worked on reserve studies. That could be a, a, a way of vetting that company. I also think that it's really important to remember that this is a board issue. The communication between the reserve study professional and the board and the association should be managed by the board, not by random homeowners. So you don't want your reserve study professional out there for the site visit with, you know, 17 different homeowners walking up to them and saying, why are you putting the roof in for this year? It needs to be replaced sooner or, you know, later or whatever. But the board can certainly communicate whatever you would like to communicate and share with the reserve study professional. You should provide them with all information that you think is relevant to the reserve study. 
And if you notice things on the reserve study that just don't seem right to you, I think it would be a great idea to be proactive and ask your reserve study company about those items, how receptive they are to those questions and suggestions or communications can tell you a lot about whether that company is a good fit for your community long term. Um, it's also worth mentioning that you might need a legal opinion to make sure that the components listed in the reserve study are accurate. So we have a lot of clients where uh, they've had reserve studies done that either mistakenly include components in the reserve study that are not the association's responsibility or mistakenly leave those things out, leave out things that the association is responsible for. So sometimes you need a legal opinion that you can then provide to your reserve study company saying these things have to be included, these things should not be included. Um, make sure the reserve study company understands the values of your particular community. So from community to community, how proactive you wanna be about the maintenance and the appearance and how often you paint or whatever of certain things, is different. And I think it's important for your reserve study professional to understand your community's value set when it comes to things like that. I also think it's important to keep in mind that a reserve study is not a maintenance schedule. So part of the question said, you know, you want to trust the reserve calendar. It's not a calendar. It's not a maintenance schedule. It is a essentially a budgeting tool that in a perfect world, in a vacuum, without any other sort of factors that can affect the way your reserve study professional thinks things will play out. This tool is a budgeting tool that will allow you to pay for costs as they arise. It is not a, a maintenance calendar or schedule because uh, it's just impossible to predict the future. Your decks might fail two years before the reserve study professional thinks they should fail. Your roof might last five years longer than the useful life of a roof of that type. So Keep in mind that it's not a maintenance schedule, it's a savings and budgeting plan so you can pay for reserve related expenses. Um, Ken, did you wanna add anything to that one? Uh, two things. One is there are two entities which certify reserve study professionals. It's not a requirement in Washington state, but CAI has a program where they give a certification for reserve specialists. And there's another organization called APRA, the Association of Professional Reserve Analysts. And APRA also has a nearly identical criteria for certifying an experienced reserve study professional. And then the second thing is that if you don't like the results of your reserve study, you're convinced that somehow the cost estimates are wrong or the time until replacement is wrong, you can get better information because your reserve study professional is often not a construction professional. They, they may not have a lot of experience. They're just counting things and throwing industry averages at them. So if you wanna hire a roofing consultant to give you better information about when your roof might need to be replaced or how it might need to be replaced. And if you want to get actual cost estimates for replacement of things like elevators or roofs or painting, you can give that better information to your reserve study professional to incorporate into the study and you will get a more accurate picture of what financing you need. And then the other thing is that just because the reserve study says you need money does not mean you need to save it. And we have many, many clients who do not follow the recommendations of the reserve study in how much money they set aside every year. The legislature does not require that you save money. They only require that you get the information about how much you should save and give it to all your owners so that if the association is not choosing to save the money, the owners at least are aware that these major expenses are coming up and they need to be prepared on their own to fund a special assessment for them. Thank you, Ken. All right, here's our next question. Associations must now send out a very specific notice of delinquency according to RCW 6438-100. Is the management company required to send this or does the association's attorney send this if or when we send an account over? We wanna be sure we are advising our board members correctly. So this question refers to the new foreclosure prerequisites that went into effect for all associations in 2021. 
And the HOA Act reference that was provided by the person who submitted the question is accurate, but I just put into the chat references to all of the other statutes that also require the same thing. So regardless of whether you're an HOA, Old Act, New Act, Wakiowa community, you have to send this pre-foreclosure notice of delinquency. As long as the correct notice is sent and you can document it, it doesn't matter whether it's mailed by the board, the management company, or the association's attorney. It is important to keep in mind the timing that is required slash allowed by the statute. And so here's the way that it works. An association cannot begin a foreclosure action unless the owner owes at least $200 or three months assessments, whichever is greater. And as a, an aside, you have to calculate that sum without including fines, late fees, interest, attorney's fees, or costs. So we have a lot of clients that ask us questions about, well, can't we just apply the payment to these other charges to make sure that the assessment balance always adds up to the right amount? The statute is drafted in a way that I think is fairly unambiguous and that doesn't allow you to um, avoid the way they calculate this pre-foreclosure like threshold balance due just by changing how you apply payments. And there's not a court case out there yet because this is a relatively new process and statute. So unless you wanna be the test case, I think the cautious way to, to approach this is um, consistent with the, you know, the advice that we give. So they have to owe at least $200 or three months unpaid assessments without including any of the other types of charges that we listed. Then on or after the day be, the account becomes 90 days delinquent, then you have to send this very specific pre-foreclosure notice of delinquency. Then you have to also wait at least 180 days after the minimum amount due accrued, so that $200 or three months assessments. And also the board has to specifically approve a foreclosure action for the particular unit or property. So that's way more than the question asked for. The question asked, who has to send this? Do we have to send it? Does the board have to send it? The answer is, it doesn't matter who sends it as long as the correct notice is sent and the timeline is followed. I will offer that very few of our clients, maybe 10 or 20% of them, send that notice before the accounts get sent to our office. And so it is built into our process, at least, to review and determine whether that notice of delinquency has been sent and to determine the timing at which we can send it to make sure that we're complying with all of those prerequisites before we end up doing a foreclosure lawsuit. So we don't mind doing it. Uh, we also, when we draft a collection policy for a client, we include a template of a cover letter and the notice of delinquency that's required by the statute so that the client can go ahead and send it if they want to be the ones that do it. So I think the most important thing is that you send it, that you pay attention to the timeline. If you do send it, make sure you provide a copy to the association attorney when you send the account for collections so they can confirm that the notice that was sent is consistent with the statute. Um, the other thing is one of the things that we do that I, you know, not everybody thinks about, I think, is uh, there are links and phone numbers in the notice of delinquency that change. Not often, but every once in a while we discover that a link has changed or that a phone number has changed. And so we try really hard to make sure that we are uh, constantly updating uh, the notices so that they're providing the notice that's required by the statute. So that I, that's just one thing that you can keep in mind when thinking about who should be the one to send it. Ken, did you have anything you wanted to add to that one? Nope, I'm good. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into some questions from the chat. One is, we are a 6434 condo, so they're a new act condo. Which portions of Wakiowa 6490 apply to us? So I'm gonna take a stab at this and then Ken can fill in anything that I might have missed. Um, number one, the budget ratification section applies to you. So the budget ratification section of Wakiowa applies to everybody, every community association in Washington state. That is RCW 6490-525. Uh, number two, the reserve study section, which is RCW 6490-545. 545. I should have known you would know that off the top of your head. 
that's newer. So that didn't apply to everybody when Wakaiowa was enacted in 2018, but when they updated the statute and either, was it 19 or 20 that they made the reserve study pr uh, provision? 19. Okay. Uh, there's also a section of Wakaiowa that talks about adopting Wakaiowa and a more streamlined process for uh, making that decision, uh, voting on amendments uh, consistent with that decision that would apply to your community. Um, and, and that one is 6490, sorry, I'm losing my list here, 6490, 080 and 085, I think. Am I missing anything, Ken? Well, 649545 sweeps in all of the reserve study provisions of Ukiowa. So 649550 also applies. That's the significant one because that's the one that describes the reserve study and what its requirements are. So they both the Condo Act and the HOA Act still have reserve study requirements written in them. And they are slightly different than Ukiowa's. And we have a lot of reserve study professionals who keep trying to do the requirements from the other statutes. But Ukiowa is the newer and specifically trumps those other statutes. So the method of calculating the surplus or deficiency on a reserve uh, study for all the units is included in 649550. And that's what you follow for your budget disclosures and how you perform the reserve study. I don't care that there are still listed in the HOA Act, eight different disclosures you're supposed to make with your budget um, under the HOA Act. That has been replaced, even though the legislature didn't do us the favor of specifically deleting it from the statute. Thank you, Ken. All right, here's our next question. What is the most effective way for an HOA to receive updates and stay up to date on changes in state law governing common interest communities? Well, I mean, I think this Q&A is a great start, <laughs> but I'm a little biased. Um, I'm gonna go back to what I talked about a little bit earlier, which is membership in the Washington State Community Associations Institute. I think WSCAI membership provides uh, community boards with a lot of ongoing education. They have events like uh, one event annually called Law Day, which usually occurs in Linwood and is limited to topics that are of a legal nature. Then they have a conference in the fall. So that one's usually in April. There's a conference in the fall that's called CA Day, which is Community Associations Day. That one's at the Washington State Convention Center, downtown Seattle. And there are educational topics that are a lot broader in nature that pertain to community associations. They also publish a journal every other month, I think, that contains articles written by professionals in a variety of different fields related to community associations. So they've got articles written by accountants, by reserve study professionals, by managers, by lawyers, um, by all different types of folks that are in the know in the industry and that serve community associations as a client base. Um, they also have national conferences. If that's something that you're interested in, there are, I know of at least one manager locally who attends the national law seminar every year to stay informed on legal, challenge, uh, legal changes. And for what it's worth, many, many, many of the attorneys in our practice area in Washington state are members of WSCAI and travel to the National Law Seminar every year so that we can stay up to date on those legal changes and then make sure that we're passing them on to our clients. Um, this next coming year is up in New Orleans, which I'm excited about. It's a little bit of a flight, but I think it'll be a fun trip and it's also a really, a really valuable learning experience. So I think attending things like this Q&A, other types of, oh, WSCAI also does monthly webinars for board members. So they have they have tons and tons and tons of educational opportunities. And if you want to learn more about WSCAI or you would like us to put you in touch with their executive director to talk about a membership, just send us an email at info at condolaw.net and we can connect you with Michelle. Ken, did you have other suggestions for how communities can stay up to date on legal changes? One other, the national CAI 
has a members open forum digest, which is published daily by email. And it includes questions and answers from people all across the country, but there are some very active Washington state participants. And those participants tend to provide answers to questions that would be related to Washington state on a regular basis. And so if you're willing to pony up the $80 or whatever it costs to be a member of the national organization, you can get access to their website, not just to see what's going on that other people are thinking about, but you can post questions there. And uh, it's a community of essentially volunteers who will give you free advice that is not legal advice, <laughs> and uh, you can have a better idea of what other people in, in the community are thinking. I will offer the caveat that if you are looking for commentary and uh, of a legal nature, uh, you know, Ken, I think covered it by saying it's not legal advice, but I think sometimes people think they're, they're right about things that they're not always right about. And so take it with a grain of salt and understand um, that the commentary is just that, a conversation or commentary. And if you're really curious about something that will significantly impact your community, then consult with your association attorney. I'll also also offer something that I say every now and then on this Q&A, which is that I think it's important if you don't have an association attorney to establish a relationship with one now when you don't really need it. Don't wait until your community is in crisis over something of a legal nature to then scramble around and try to find a lawyer to help you with that when you have that sense of urgency. Take the time now when you don't have a specific legal need to uh, reach out to and meet a few of the attorneys in this practice area and, and establish a relationship with an attorney that is familiar with your association and your documents so that if you have questions about legal changes or other things as time goes on, you've got a resource that can answer those questions for you. All right, the last question that I'm looking at from the chat, unless Chelsea, you got anything directly, is the minimum of ownership percentage voting to force the board to include reserve study expense in next year's budget just limited to reserve studies? Or can owners demand anything be included in the budget in this manner? No, you can, so owners do not have the right by statute anyways to vote and force the board to include other specific things in the budget outside of the reserve study. There isn't a similar mechanism for the audit, is there, Ken? No. I didn't think so. The assumption is that you will just comply with the law. Right. <laughs> I love the smile on your face when you say that. Uh, so no, owners don't have the right to force board members to add things to the budget. That being said, we know a lot of community associations that struggle to get enough um, participation from owners to volunteer to be on the board or to serve on different committees, including the budget committee. So I think uh, providing feedback to your board, attending the board meetings, volunteering when there's a request for volunteers, et cetera, those are all ways that you as an owner can um, increase the chances that your voice will be heard on topics that are important to you within your community. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Ken? Yeah, the requirement uh, that was put into the statute uh, allowing owners to force the reserve study be, to be done was included in 2008 when the reserve study requirement was first incorporated into the Condominium Act. And it's because there was a large number of primarily developer attorneys who did not want to create even more expense for their clients related to construction of a new, uh, new condominium. And so they put in a provision that basically says the board gets to decide whether or not to do a reserve study, even though two sections earlier it says you must do a reserve study. And then they put in this remedy in order to sort of satisfy the large number of parties and the diverse opinions about whether or not reserve studies should be required or not required. And so that's kind of the history. And all of the other statutes got adopted without that kind of a, um, a battle between the attorneys creating conflicting or confusing legislation. Thanks, Ken. 
All right, I think that's it. We are at 10.59 and we're out of questions. So I think our timing this week was perfect. Thank you all for joining us. Remember, we are not meeting next week. So we'll see you in two weeks. Happy Thanksgiving to those who celebrate and thank you for joining us. Bye everybody.